Right. Good morning. Um, welcome to another lecture from uh, Link Data and the Semantic Web. And today we are going to talk about Link Data patterns. Um, it is basically a catalog of best practices that uh, you should uh, somehow implement in your Link Data um, efforts. Um, it is a catalog of short, um, short examples of uh, situations and how to deal with them. Um, basically, it is also a catalog of uh, problems um, that you might encounter uh, and uh, approaches uh, to how to solve them or avoid those problems. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get to it. Uh, some of those you will already recognize because I mentioned them when I talked about the RDF data model or um, let's say um, approaches to creating IRIs for entities you have in your data, or maybe IRIs for classes and predicates in your RDF vocabularies and so on. Um, so uh, in that case, some of those uh, patterns will be uh, repetition of what you already know, but I think that's actually a good thing because it means that uh, you already understand some of the issues that uh, you might encounter. So um, in today's lecture, we will go through five sets of uh, patterns, each focused on a different part of uh, the uh, linked data uh, life cycle, let's say. So uh, when I talk about life cycle, imagine uh, how we talked about how you can publish your linked data. So first you need to establish some IRI patterns, um, rules, uh, how you will identify your things in your data. Um, once you have those, you need to think about what predicates and uh, classes, vocabularies you will use in your data. So those could be labeled as modeling patterns. Um, then once you have your data ready, so you have proper identifiers and proper classes and predicates, um, you need to publish the data somehow. You can publish it as an RDF file, as an RDF dump, you can use a Sparkle endpoint to publish the data. And um, for instance, you can also uh, try to embed the data into web pages. So um, those patterns are grouped in the publishing patterns section. Um, and then once you have your data published, you might start using it. Uh, and uh, then you need to think about how to actually manage uh, various data sets uh, and uh, how to structure your database and so on. So those will be the data management patterns. And then from the other side, uh, from the side of the consumer of such data, uh, we'll talk about the application patterns. So how you actually can use the data and uh, what situations you might encounter yourself in uh, from that aspect. Uh, we'll start from the beginning. So we'll start with the uh, identifier patterns. Uh, and uh, here we'll talk about how you should uh, create IRIs uh, so that they are usable. Um, and uh, the rule says that the IRIs should be good, clean, and stable. Uh, one thing I'm not sure if I mentioned is uh, that uh, once you create an IRI for something, and uh, this, uh, I mean, in, in production somewhere, um, the IRI should never disappear. Um, once you create an IRI, it should be there forever. Uh, and uh, it might happen that actually you uh, stop representing the resource that uh, the IRI identified. But in that case, um, the IRI is still there. It is still used on the web. And uh, one of the patterns I will mention uh, near the end of the lecture deals with this situation. Basically, it means that uh, you should remember that you used that IRI uh, in, in some time in, uh, in past. And when someone asks about that IRI, you should tell them that, yes, this IRI was there, but it was deleted, uh, which is always better than saying just uh, the typical 404 error, which says, hmm, not found. I don't know what happened, right? So. Uh, Already, when you think about how you will create your IRIs, you should think about also how you will maintain those IRIs and uh, treat them as your data evolves. Uh, 
Um, and for that, you need the conventions that we call IRI patterns. Um, if there are no conventions, no patterns, your data will look something like this. So uh, basically it will be a mix of uh, different styles of creating IRIs, different languages, different uh, types of dealing with uppercase, lowercase and escapes and so on. So it will be a mess and no one will be uh, able to use those IRIs um, in a systematic way, for instance. So this brings us to our first pattern, which is called patterned IRIs. Uh, this pattern is usable in many simple situations. And basically it says that uh, you should think about what type uh, the resource is. Let's say here we have books. And uh, once, uh, once you have the type, you also think about how you will identify the individual um, things of this type. So for instance, books have uh, ISBN numbers uh, or some other identifiers. So here in this case, the pattern is use a pluralized class name. So we'll have books uh, in the uh, IRI path and then the ID of the book. And this is somehow unique within that data set. Right, so that's the first example. The second example, um, talks about that uh, you have IRIs typically, uh, you have typically other IRI patterns for uh, instances. So for the individual things and for classes and predicates, which you'll find in uh, vocabularies. Uh, so here we have some uh, regions in uh, Ruyan. Ruyan is uh, the registry of all addresses and buildings in the Czech Republic. Um, so each one has an IRI. Uh, and therefore it is a good, exa good example. And here we can see how we can have a pattern IRI for uh, resources and then a pattern IRI for classes. For instance, here we have the class for region and here we have an instance of, uh, of a region. And the pattern is we'll use HTTPS, we'll use this domain name, and then we'll use resource uh, and uh, Rulian and the type and some ID in case of resources. And in case of classes, we'll use vocabulary, again, Ruan, and then uh, for instance, uh, the class name with uh, an uppercase letter. And we can create a rule out of this, and then we can stick to the rule when we create IRIs for uh, other resources and classes. When we have a slightly more complex situation, we'll talk about hierarchical IRIs, where uh, when one thing, in some sense owns other things, like uh, a book owns its chapters, um, then the recommendation here is to uh, basically apply the hierarchy, uh, the, the patterned IRI um, in a hierarchy, which means that uh, we'll have, uh, for instance, here uh, books and ID of the book, and then the book owns chapters. So we'll have chapters and ID of the chapter within the book. So this is again, a simple rule that we can follow uh, that uh, makes the IRIs uh, that we create uh, nice and clean. Uh, there is another example uh, from uh, the uh, server that we already worked with uh, where we have business entities and business entities have postal addresses. Um, so here we will have resource then business entity because that's the type of the class. In this case, we have a singular here and then some ID, which is unique within the data set, which is CZ and uh, the identification number. And then we'll have the addresses. And because one business entity can have multiple addresses, we'll have some identifier of what kind of address we are representing. So this is a hierarchical IRI, basically the patterned IRI applied in a hierarchy. Um, another identifier pattern called natural keys uh, deals with the situation uh, where we basically focus on the identifier part. Typically in your data set, when you are dealing with things, those things already have some identifiers in the data set. Those identifiers are typically local because those are sequences of numbers or something like that, uh, primary keys in database tables and so on. However, those can be used at the end of uh, a pattern or hierarchical IRI. Um, so 
This is called a natural key, a key that already exists in the data set and you use it as a part of uh, an IRI. Um, by the way, those, um, those uh, patterns are mostly uh, of these, the, the identifier patterns and the modeling patterns are usable uh, in your semester projects, I think. Uh, but we already talked about those identifier patterns a little bit. So I think you already follow them. If not, uh, you might think about that a little bit. Right, the next pattern called IRI slug deals with the situation when we do not have a suitable key uh, to use in our IRI and we have uh, a text possibly with multiple words and we need to deal with that. And there, there are again, many options uh, of how uh, we can deal with uh, multiple words and uh, creating pieces of IRIs out of those. So here we have, uh, for instance, heavy metal and uh, we uh, do the transformation to lowercase and we replace the space with uh, the minus sign. So that's one option. Uh, there are many other options. You can use whichever you want, uh, but you should clearly uh, design your IRI patterns so that they include those choices and uh, then you should stick to them. Um, Another pattern regarding keys is uh, called shared keys. And this one basically deals with the situation when you have two data sets about similar things. Uh, and in one data set, there are already some keys that you can use and you are creating your own data set about the same things. So the recommendation here is to use the same keys that uh, someone else has already generated. Uh, for instance, here we have BBC uh, and uh, Music Brains. Um, they both contain data about artists. And uh, the, uh, the pattern here is that the ID, which is actually some randomly assigned ID at the end, is shared between those two. So even though, <clears throat> even though you do not know from the URI which artist this is, um, they actually at least share the, the identifier at the end which you can then later use for linking, for instance, for, for the simple case. Um, regarding linking in your project, um, I told you that one of the tasks should be the non-trivial linking. And this uh, obviously is the trivial linking uh, case, but actually in real world, this is the goal <laughs> to make the data sets as linkable as possible, if not linked already. Um, so yeah, this, uh, when you already see those keys used somewhere, you should definitely use, reuse them in your data set as well. Um, another pattern is called proxy keys. And uh, this one uh, we have seen, I think, in an example when we talked about a data key vocabulary, uh, but uh, I will explain it a little bit further. Um, when we talked about the RDF data key vocabulary, uh, I told you that one of the common dimensions is the reference period, the time dimension. And uh, for that time dimension, there is this British service, uh, which gives you an IRI for every uh, time instant or time interval. And uh, if you dereference that IRI, you get some interesting data about that time instant or time interval. Now, uh, you can use those IRIs directly as values on dimensions of your data cubes, for instance. Um, however, there is a slight problem, uh, and that is what happens when that British service um, has an outage, stops working for a moment, and you use those IRIs in your data uh, to link to the time dimension. So if you just link to that IRI of the British service and uh, do nothing more, uh, then um, whenever you want to work with the data cube and uh, for instance, um, realize which day exactly is this, uh, this IRI, the British one, uh, you shouldn't parse the IRI, you should be reference it and look in the data, right? So if you want to present the data cube to your users, for instance, you need to dereference that IRI to know which day it represents, for instance. And um, when that service has an outage and doesn't work, you cannot do that. 
and therefore you use the uh, you lose the ability to interpret your own data because you linked to a foreign data set which stopped working. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Uh, it is useful to link to, to, to those other data sets. But if there is a risk of uh, losing some ability to work with the data that you need to have uh, all the time, you can use this pattern, proxy keys. And basically what it does is um, that uh, you keep the link to the foreign data set, uh, but at the same time, you create your own IRI for the same thing and you link to uh, the other IRI using our same S. Um, so this is called a proxy key for, for this uh, IRI. Um, the advantage is that you can store some of the data from, from this URI uh, in your data set. And therefore, when uh, this service has an outage, um, you still have access to the important pieces of data. Um, so it is a form of caching, but uh, it is not uh, just caching because you do not just cache the response to the dereference of this IRI, you create your own keys, your proxy keys, and store some important pieces of information with those uh, new IRIs. So this is the proxy uh, keys pattern. Uh, and um, the last pattern regarding identifiers uh, is called literal keys. And this one deals with the situation when you have identifiers in your data, which are somehow secondary, but you still want to represent them. And basically what the pattern says is do not forget about this property from the Dublin core vocabulary, uh, which is called DC terms identifier. Uh, and you can use that to store identifiers, which are not IRIs. And you can even create um, uh, your own properties, which are sub properties of the identifier to say that uh, this new property is an identifier or links to an identifier or contains a literal value of an identifier. Uh, and um, still you can uh, add your own uh, labels and uh, descriptions to this property because the fact that it is an identifier is represented by the sub property of relation here. Right, so those were patterns regarding to identifiers. So let's say we already know uh, how to create identifiers and we can move on to uh, modeling patterns. Now, if we model for RDS, uh, it is a bit different than uh, modeling for, let's say, a relation database. So creating an RDS schema out of uh, uh, or for a relational database. The difference is that uh, in RDF, we basically do not have any strict schema um, in the sense uh, of a relational schema for a relational database or an XML schema for XML files. Um, a buzzword for this is uh, this somewhere here. Yeah, that uh, RDF, sco RDF stores are schemaless or schema free uh, because they are just sets of RDF triples and that's it. And you can use any. Um, I arise in those uh, triples you want. Um, and there is no restrictive schema language. There is RDF schema, but RDF schema only explains what certain IRIs of predicates and classes actually mean. You can describe those, you can label those, uh, and then you can use those in your data, but uh, they do not restrict you in any, uh, in any way. The difference uh, with modeling for RDF is also that uh, the data model is close to the real world. So uh, when we talked about how you should uh, model your data sets or document your data sets, we talked about conceptual modeling and how you can use UML class diagrams to represent entities of real world and their relations and attributes. Um, and basically when you take this UML class diagram, uh, it already corresponds to the structure that uh, your RDF classes and predicates will have. Um, you could see that in the introductory le uh, lecture where I showed you the example of public contracts, where we first analyzed the data we had about public contracts. We created the UML class diagrams, and then we basically covered those by changing the titles of classes to URLs of RDF classes and uh, changed the labels of relations and attributes 
two URLs of predicates uh, in RDF, and that was it. The structure was almost the same. This doesn't happen with uh, relational databases because in relational databases, you optimize for performance, uh, you use normal forms um, and so on. So the database schema actually is further from how the real world is structured. And uh, in RDF, we are closer to that. The effect of this is that uh, the data model in RDF doesn't change so often because the real world around us also does not change so often. Um, so yeah, those are some, some differences. Um, also with linked data you, and creating linked data, you are always free to model just a little bit of your data, create that subset of data as linked data, and then uh, extend this um, subset until you get to the full data set and full transformation without actually the need for changing what you have already done before. Uh, so you can start with uh, one class and a few attributes, and then you can add more attributes as needed and more classes and relations as needed to the transformation. And typically you do not need to change what you did uh, before. Again, this is different from relational databases because there typically you need to create the whole transformation first because you need to create the whole database schema first, and then it is hard to make changes to that or additions. Right, so, so those are some generic remarks about differences of modeling for RDF and modeling for uh, other data models. And now let's get to the specific uh, patterns. So here, um, this is just a reminder basically that in RDF, the literals have data types. So whenever your literal has a structured value, you should uh, designate its data type. Uh, typically we use the XML schema data types for that. So if you have a date, then you indicate that this is a date uh, by using the XML schema date data type. Um, this was uh, especially important in the past when uh, RDF 1.0 was um, the RDF version to be used because there uh, we could have a literal with no data type whatsoever. So we couldn't say anything about that literal. Uh, in RDF 1.1, this is no longer the case because uh, whenever you do not specify uh, a data type of a literal, it is just a syntactic shortcut for saying that it is at least an XML schema string. But then again, this is um, very generic. So uh, you need to be more specific in cases where it is appropriate. So for dates, booleans, numbers, and so on, you should specify the data type of that literal. So that's all that uh, this pattern actually says. Uh, another pattern says that if you are not satisfied with the commonly used XML schema data types, you can always create your own data type. Just assign an IRI to it and use it in the data type part of uh, the literal, and then you can describe it. For instance, here we have a FedEx shipping code. So we want to be able to uh, say that um, in our data uh, here, that uh, this is not just a regular string, it has some structure. Um, it, it is not a structure of any known XML schema data type. So we create our own data type. We say that this IRI is a FedEx shipping code, and then we use this IRI in the uh, data type part of the literal. Um, there is an alternative. We can have this description, FedEx shipping code, um, as a label of a separate property. So uh, then uh, the value is a string, but the property says that the string has a um, uh, inner syntax. Um, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the first one is uh, more precise because, because it, it is right there with the value um, saying this is of a special data type that is described somewhere. Another pattern we also already talked about, and this one is called label everything. Uh, this has to do with the fact that it is nice to have everything identified using IRIs so that uh, everything has a globally unique identifier that you can ask for uh, using HTTP for the data based on that identifier and all that. Uh, but the IRIs are of course not a good thing to show to end users, to users of applications uh, 
to users or readers of some analyses on top of data and so on. For those, you need to have a human readable label for everything, basically, because every piece of data eventually ends up in some kind of uh, user facing application or uh, some um, article uh, that you want to publish somewhere and you need uh, to be able to show every piece of data to a human um, and for them you need to have labels so label everything says whenever you create an iri you should also have a human readable label saying what that iri actually represents last time we talked about scos one of the vocabularies um, used in uh, the web of data and uh, we talked about how it can be used for code lists hierarchies, taxonomies, and so on. And we already, uh, also talked about the fact that SCOS defines three types of labels, the preferred label, the alternate label, and the hidden label. This pattern um, emphasizes that the preferred label from SCOS can be used anywhere you need to say that um, this label is the preferred one. Uh, so for instance, in, uh, in this example, uh, we have a library system where we have uh, names of people borrowing books and uh, those people have a given name and family name uh, using false. Uh, but this is not how um, the librarian wants to see that name. The librarian wants to see a uh, family name, um, a comma, and then a given name. And for them, this is the preferred label. So uh, this uh, label which is not any uh, natural label present in the data already can be created and stored using press label from SCOS. So again, whenever you want to prefer one of the labels, you can use SCOS pref label uh, even outside of the scope of code lists and taxonomies and so on. Repeated property again just emphasizes the fact that uh, you can have multiple RDF triples statements where the subject and the property or the predicate are the same and only the object uh, is different uh, each time. And this means that for some subject, some property has multiple values. Uh, what this pattern also emphasizes is that you shouldn't have structured literals unless they are of course of some known data type such as XML schema date or date time or something like that. Uh, but you shouldn't invent your own uh, lists within literals. Uh, for that, you should use separate values and uh, decide whether you need to keep the ordering, then use the RDF list or not, and then just use multiple RDF triples with the same subject and the same predicate. Of course, we are on the web and uh, we create data for the web and the web is inherently multilingual. So this pattern, multilingual literal, again, emphasizes the fact that literals which contain natural text should have language tags. And when you um, focus on a multilingual environment, you should have labels for your things in multiple languages. Um, you can, again, use SCOS pref label for that. The rule is that you can have one preferred label per a natural language. So uh, yeah, preferred label and uh, language tags. Um, another pattern is called link not label. And uh, this one I also already talked about. Uh, whenever you would have a, uh, you would have multiple instances in your data with the same literal value saying that it belongs to some category, let's say like here we have uh, books and uh, the, the books have format. And here we want to say that the book uh, is of the hardback format. Well, uh, this is not the ideal way to do it because you would have uh, thousands of books all having uh, a literal saying it is hardback. Um, when we would model this, uh, we would prefer uh, to have a book which connects to a code list of formats uh, where each format has its own IRI and this format then has the label which can be stated only once uh, and uh, then from the books we link to those uh, items in those code lists. 
So this um, pattern is called link, not label. Um, and uh, yeah, it is really important and it is a very common mistake in semester projects. Um, you can also overdo it with this. So uh, if you would like to have, for instance, an IRI for each number that uh, you have in your data set, I think this is going too far, unless there is, of course, a proper reason to do that and a good use case for, for doing that. But uh, typically this is uh, doing it too much. Um, there is also the border case. We have, again, the British service, which gives you data for each year. So whenever you want to represent a year somewhere, you have a choice. Either you link to this British service or an alternative in some other country, or you can have a literal of the proper data type, which for years is uh, this XSDG year. Um, here, again, it depends on the use case, whether you want to actually use the data or enable your users to have access to the data provided by the external service or not. Um, there is no clear winner. And both approaches are in some ways correct. Right, the next case uh, deals with the fact that in RDF, uh, all relations are binary. So uh, the relation always goes from a particular subject to a particular object. And uh, it happens sometimes in the real world that actually the relations are not just binary, uh, they can be anary. Um, it can be a relation of more than two um, entities in the data. And uh, there you could have a difficulty of representing this fact in RDF using binary relations. So the pattern here tells you how to do it in a way that other uh, people are dealing with link data do it. And that is um, you create an entity representing that relation then you link to all those entities in that relation. And as a bonus, you can uh, label that relation and have some other uh, metadata about that relation. It is a little uh, like the, um, like the reification that we talked about when you have a triple and uh, you create an entity out of the triple and you specify that the triple has a subject a predicate and an object. You basically create an uh, anary relation of that triple uh, saying that this subject, this predicate, and this object are in the relation called an RDF statement. So this is, this is similar. Um, another use case for the same approach is called a qualified relation. When you need to say that, for instance, a relation um, has some additional properties, is valid from, valid to, uh, or something like that. So it is. it can still be a binary relation, as in this case. Uh, we have marriage here, so it is a binary relation. But we want to say some more um, statements about that relation, which we cannot do when uh, that relation is just a predicate used in a triple. So again, the approach is the same. We create an entity representing the relation. We connect to the related entities, and then we add some additional data. Right, um, this pattern, uh, topic relation, just again emphasizes that there is the fourth vocabulary. And in that fourth vocabulary, we have the fourth topic or fourth primary topic relations, uh, which are well known uh, on the web. And therefore, when we want to say that, uh, for instance, uh, a thing has also a web page about that thing, we connect to that web page using fourth topic or for primary topic. Um, there is also a, an inverse property, is primary topic off? So it depends uh, on uh, which direction we want to use to represent this uh, relation. So that's topic relation. Here in the examples, we have, a, uh, for instance, a Paris uh, guide, which is a website, and it relates to, to Paris. So we use the default primary topic relation for that because it just fits. Right, uh, the audit list pattern uh, emphasizes that we have also standard ways in RDF to preserving order of things. And that's the RDF list, the linked list that we talked about in the lecture about uh, 
the RDF-data model. Uh, so uh, here, there's just a reminder and uh, a name, uh, naming of that approach that basically says, if you want to preserve order, for instance, for authors, there is this RDF list, which you can use. Um, it has some uh, um, negative effects on your data because the uh, usage of those uh, lists makes the data a little bit harder to query using Sparkle. Uh, however, if you need to preserve the ordering, such as in the case of book authors and so on, uh, this is the way to do it so that everyone else understands uh, what you did there. Um, however, there are also alternate approaches, and one of those approaches is an ordering relation. So as we had an array relation and qualified relation, this is similar. It is a relation between two items uh, in a, uh, well, let's say, ordered list, uh, but it doesn't use the RDF list construct. It is uh, represented as a qualified relation where the qualifier is the order of that thing in a sequence, basically. So this is also uh, something you might want to do. Uh, there are some differences in uh, how easy it is to, to handle the data using RDF list and uh, this ordering relation uh, when you're using Sparkle. This is a little bit easier to, to query. Now, reified statement I already mentioned. So again, it is similar to uh, an array or qualified relation because, and we uh, had reification in the lecture about RDF data model. Um, basically, uh, when you want to uh, record some metadata about an RDF statement, you assign an IRI to it, or you create an entity out of it. You connect that entity to the subject, predicate, and object, and then you are free to add any metadata uh, you want. Uh, we already know that this has some disadvantages as uh, making the data larger, at least four times, four times larger than before. Um, and we already know an alternative, and those are named graphs. And we will again talk about uh, named graphs in, later in this lecture. Right, so this was the group of uh, modeling patterns. So now, we are in the situation where our data is properly identified and we know which classes and properties we'll use and which shapes we actually use in our data. So we know which relations are ordered, qualified, NRE, and so on. Um, so we have our data model and uh, entities identified and we need to publish the data on the web somehow. So in link data, there are many ways of how to publish the data on the web. You can publish uh, the data file, the entire data file containing all triples in your data. That's called an RDF dump. Um, you can uh, generate the data on the fly from your relational database. So you can basically create a web service uh, listening on a set of IRIs. And whenever someone accesses that IRI, um, you can run your own proprietary script that accesses the relation database and creates an RDF representation of the data and send that, sends that to, uh, to the user. You can uh, publish a Sparkle endpoint. So you load all your data into a RDF database, which has a Sparkle endpoint, and you publish that endpoint. Uh, and that's another way of publishing um, linked data. And uh, Yet another way is embedding that data, that machine readable data in a web page. Uh, for that, there is the RDF-A standard, which we will talk about uh, later in another lecture, but we already know JSON-LD. Uh, and uh, if you ever um, created a web page and uh, made it uh, readable by Google, let's say, then uh, you already came into contact with schema.org, the vocabulary and JSON-LD the RDF uh, serialization in which you represent the embedded data on your web page, and then you take that JSON LD snippet and embed it in your web page. And then Google accesses the web page and reads the data and uh, creates nice uh, search results for your web pages. So that's another way of uh, publishing data. So we have as a file, as a Sparkle endpoint embedded in uh, web pages and so on. 
And in all those ways of actually publishing data, there are again some patterns that emerge and that needs need to be addressed. Um, you can also view those just as best practices for, for some situations. Um, one is an equivalence link. So whenever you publish uh, your data set and it relates or has uh, the same real world objects as another data set on the web, and you know about that other data set, you should include equivalence links in your data so that your data set will be uh, usable together with the other data set. And for equivalence, we have already seen two different predicates. One is our same as, which says that uh, the subject IRI and the object IRI both identify the same real world thing. Those uh, statements can then later be used uh, so that uh, all the data about the one IRI can be treated as if it was a, um, actually a statement about the other IRI. Uh, another uh, predicate that we have seen used for this is a SCOS exact match, which says that uh, a concept is the same, uh, identified by one IRI, is the same concept as another one identified by another IRI. So those are equivalent links. Now, um, when someone accesses your IRI and you provide them with uh, data about that IRI, about that thing. Uh, what you might want to do is provide also some annotations. Uh, and annotations in this context are uh, statements about an IRI from another data set. So here uh, in this pattern, uh, we will access um, this IRI, example.org slash author slash John. And uh, we will get this triple that John is a fourth person. So that is what we would expect. But uh, we'll also get other triples about other resources. We'll get data saying that there is a wiki.example.net uh, with a page Ubuntu tips. And this uh, page has a title. So up to now, those triples are completely unrelated to John. But the relationship is that this web page was actually created by John. And then um, there is an IRI, publisher.example.org slash author slash one, two, three, four. And this IRI is the same as John. So uh, the annotation pattern here uh, addresses or name or labels the situation when you add triples about other things from other data sets to a response to, to your IMI. Now, uh, in the generic overview of uh, RDF modeling, I mentioned that uh, you can start your RDF or link data transformation with something small, let's say one class and a few properties, and then you can add more as, um, um, as you need, basically. Uh, which allows you to focus on, uh, on a small subset of your data first and then extend it later. And this is actually a principle. It is called a pay-as-you-go principle, which says uh, whenever dealing with linked data, start with something small and then progressively enrich it um, as you go uh, in, in small iterations, let's say. Um, yep. So um, this is the same principle, only named. Um, right, the C also principle, again, emphasizes one particular predicate and that's the RDFS, C also predicate, which connects an RDF resource to another RDF resource containing interesting data to the topic. So this is, this is uh, just an uh, emphasis on, on this. So we have Paris, it's a place, it has a preferred label. And then we know that there are some interesting data to be known about Paris somewhere else. So we can connect to that somewhere else using RDFSC also. In this case, the somewhere else is a resource containing some uh, links to other data sets. It might be also in a draft, for instance, but uh, yeah, it's just a resource 
in some way interesting to the, to the first one. Now, the pattern link base uh, deals with um, the fact that uh, since we are talking about linked data, we'll typically have our core data, which we produce in our information system. And then we'll have links to other data sets because we are talking about linked data. Now, the links and our core data typically evolve uh, in um, different speeds. So for instance, I can um, update my core data daily, uh, but I want to run the linking task to other data sets uh, monthly. If that is the case, it might be advantageous to actually separate those two uh, and uh, have two partitions. For instance, two named graphs, one containing the core data uh, and one containing uh, links, which is actually the case from uh, the previous slide where we had Paris and we linked to another resource which contained links to other um, IRIs used somewhere to identify Paris. So uh, this is basically a division of uh, core data coming from some uh, information system and links to other data sets. Embedded structured data is nothing more than a way of publishing RDF data within web pages. So this is RDFA where you embed uh, RDF data in attributes of HTML. Um, or there is the JSON-LD approach when you have a JSON-LD snippet embedded in a web page uh, as it is. This is an example of RDFA, but we will talk about RDFA in some of the uh, next lectures. So this is just basically a reminder again that uh, one of the ways of publishing RDF ending data is within web pages. If you um, go for another way of publishing data, which is that you have web pages separate from RDF files, then the question is how does one discover that uh, the web page has also a machine readable representation somewhere as RDF? And um, this is more from the HTML world where in HTML in your head uh, part of your HTML file, you can have links to related resources. Typically you use this for attaching style sheets or some JavaScript and so on, but you can also use the link elements to, uh, to point to RDF data, which in some way represents uh, the machine readable version of what you have on the web page. So this is one of the ways uh, a user might expect you to link from a web page to uh, RDF data. Now, um, dataset auto discovery is actually an interesting case. Um, you already know because it's one of the basic principles of linked data that uh, one of the ways of publishing linked data is through IRI dereference, which means whenever someone accesses an IRI of a thing, uh, you provide a RDF representation of the data about that thing. So this is fine, but it is not usable always. Uh, it is usable whenever you need to just uh, see data about one thing or two things or three, th three things. But uh, if you want to get uh, the whole data set, which might contain thousands or millions of things, this is not the way to go because you would have to do a million requests and so on. So it is, it is not effective. A better way is to download an RDF dump or query a Sparkle endpoint containing all the data and possibly giving you all the data. But the question here that uh, this pattern addresses is based on the IRI of one thing, how can you discover the ways of accessing the whole data set as a file or uh, as a Sparkle endpoint? In uh, one of uh, the later lectures, we'll talk about metadata. So how to describe your data sets. And uh, one of those vocabularies is called void. Um, and uh, this vocabulary uh, actually describes what is, uh, what is in this pattern. And it says, whenever you have an IRI of a thing leading to your domain, such as uh, here, data example org slash thing slash one, Whenever you have an IRI like this, on the domain, you should have also slash dot well known slash, slash void, which is actually 
a, a description of all the data sets and the access methods um, using this domain, um, including Sparkle endpoints and RDF data dumps. This means that whenever you see an IRI and you know it is an IRI of uh, a thing described in RDF, you should be able to strip the path of the IRI and attach dot well known slash void. And you should get uh, information about uh, where you have the Spark endpoints or data dumps uh, available so that you can download the whole data set. Um, well, it is not a uh, very widely used method, uh, but uh, it is, I think, a good, uh, good way of uh, approaching this problem uh, because otherwise um, it, is, uh, it involves a, a lot of human work uh, because then uh, when you do not have this description in void on this address uh, and you have just the IRI, then it is hard to actually find, let's say, a data catalog that happens to have a record for the data set containing this entity and so on. So uh, if you ever come to actually publishing link data, uh, think about this, uh, implementing this, because it might be advantageous to uh, users who might actually be uh, machines. So this is a machine uh, accessible way of actually giving access to the whole data set. Um, right, we already talked about a full primary topic and how you can attach a topic of, let's say, a web page. Uh, and uh, this is the same thing, only instead of having that as an RDF statement here, again, uh, the recommendation here is also to have it as a link element in your web page. So if you are in the situation when you publish web pages, and RDF data together. And uh, this is a way of linking to uh, primary topics uh, of your web pages. Now, uh, inference is also so something we already talked about. Uh, when we uh, played with uh, the default vocabulary in uh, the first tutorial or the second tutorial in one of the tutorials, uh, we talked about the fact that, for instance, when you say something, has a family name and that name. From this single statement, you can already um, um, derive another statement saying that the subject is a fourth person. Because in that vocabulary, it is said that the domain of the full family name predicate is an instance of a fourth person, or the domain is fourth person, the class. And this says that whenever you use the false family name property, the subject becomes the instance of a false person. So then you have a choice. Either you include this additional statement that someone is a false person, or you do not have to include it. If you can uh, say, or uh, if you expect that, for instance, the RDF database in which this RDF statement is present knows the full vocabulary and allows or supports something, something called reasoning or inference, which is the deriving of additional statements based on the knowledge embedded in vocabularies. Um, however, the majority of RDF triple stores actually do not uh, or does, does not implement um, inference by default. And also inference and reasoning is computationally expensive. So uh, if you want your data to be accessible by uh, applications running on limited hardware, such as your mobile phone and so on, um, it is better to actually store the inferred triples uh, to materi materialize them. And that is what this pattern is uh, all about. So here, for instance, we have full family name. And from that, we can infer that A here is a person. Uh, then uh, we had uh, the example with primary driver, where we had the primary driver property. And from that, we could infer that also A is a driver of the vehicle B. Um, we had SCOS, where we talked about inference. And we talked about how from uh, the fact that A points using broader to B and B points using broader to C, we can infer 
that uh, A points to C using the Broder transitive property. And uh, also from SCOS, um, there is an example with inverse properties. So from the fact that A points using SCOS Broder to B, we can infer that B should point to A using SCOS narrower. So those are all statements that can be inferred from statements that we already have. And we can think about whether or not to actually materialize them, store them in our data. Um, yeah, so uh, the reason for doing that is uh, to enable uh, simpler applications to work with the data. Uh, use case is, uh, when I go back to this slide, um, imagine a sparkline point uh, having this triple in, in the database. Now you'll ask using Sparkle, are there any people in that endpoint? So the, the, the Sparkle query uh, will have uh, the where clause saying S um, a fourth person, let's say, uh, as being the variable. We will ask for all instances of fourth person. Now, if the RDF database does not support inference and it only contains this triple, the answer will be empty because there are no instances of, uh, there are no RDF statements saying that A is a person. If the triple store uh, supports reasoning and knows about the rules in the full vocabulary, then it will give me A as a full person because of this triple being in the data. So that's, that's the difference. And some, um, some triple stores and applications do this and some do not. So then it is up to you to actually decide whether or not to leave those inferred um, and this inference to the applications or whether to actually store, store those uh, triples with your data. Right, this is the pattern uh, that I already mentioned, unpublish. Once you create an IRI, it should be, or it should stay uh, created forever. So if you decide to actually um, get rid of the entity uh, identified by an IRI, so let's say, uh, you have a person and the person dies, so you want to delete them from your information system. Uh, later, when someone accesses the IRI of the person, you should not return 404, not found, because that doesn't tell anything um, about that IRI to the user. You should use, for instance, the 410 code here, which says gone, or you should use um, a specific code for um, for saying that the service is currently unavailable and so on. And uh, this, the solution to this is actually based on the HTTP protocol, which already contains a variety of status codes and so on, which you can use uh, to uh, represent all the different situations that might happen. Uh, so the worst thing you can do is use 404 as a response code. And uh, the last of uh, the patterns in this group is called edit trail. And uh, you might already know this one from web pages, where you might come across a web page uh, that uh, looks like this, and it has a link saying, let's say, edit on GitHub. Uh, this allows you to, uh, when you find a mistake on the web page, you know that you can click and correct it quite easily. Um, the same thing can be used in your data. So in your data, you can have a property linking to a place where you can edit that piece of data whenever you find a mistake in it. So this is a um, hint to the community that they can help with the quality of the data um, by explicitly linking to a place where they can contribute to, uh, to the data. So again, if you are in the situation where you have some let's say collaboratively created data set, you might want to think about storing the links to the editing um, tools for the data set um, directly in the data. Right, so those were the publishing patterns. So now we should be in the situation where we have the data, the data is properly identified, um, it is properly modeled and it is published on the web. So we already have our dumps, smart endpoints, 
embedded uh, data in web pages and so on. And uh, now the data lives, um, lives <laughs> and we need to adapt to change and so on. So we want to manage uh, the data sets. So one of the management tools for data sets that we already know are named graphs. So named graphs as an alternative to reification uh, allow us to name a set of RDF statements. So that's what a named graph is. The name of the graph is of course an IRI because it is a thing. So we uh, assign an IRI to it. And then uh, this is the trig uh, syntax where we have our triples and in the curly braces, all the triples belong to one named graph. And the name of the graph is the IRI used with the graph keyword. So we already talked about how this can be used to store additional uh, metadata about uh, the triples in that named graph. But there are also other, uh, other, use case, uh, other more specific use cases for using named graphs. We have already seen uh, the use case where named graphs in a triple store were used to separate data from different data sets. Uh, so we had uh, one triple store containing the data set of the Czech Trade Inspection Authority, for instance, in one named graph. And in another named graph, there were code lists used in a completely different context, let's say. So this is one of the ways um, that uh, can be used, or uh, one of the use cases for named graphs. Um, the metadata that you use for named graphs or you attach to named graphs, again, can have multiple use cases or various use cases. Uh, you can use uh, the metadata, for instance, for access control. So you have an application uh, which edits the data and you want some users to be able to edit some named graphs and uh, different users to be able to edit different named graphs. You can use named graphs for versioning. So you can have one data set in multiple versions in multiple named graphs so that you can query um, historical versions of data sets. Um, it is an alternative to reified statement. We already know that one. Uh, we have multiple data sets. You can use, uh, this is related to versioning. You can use audiographs to actually replicate data uh, in multiple instances or uh, across multiple databases, because you can say that uh, you have a cluster of databases and uh, you can then select the named graphs that you replicated uh, across those databases. Um, right, so there are many different use cases for, for named graphs. Now, there is one issue, which I also already mentioned, when querying a triple store using named graphs. And this issue is that uh, when you have all your data in named graphs, you have the default graph, the one which doesn't have uh, any name, you have it empty. And uh, the first thing anyone does when creating a Sparkle query is that they ask for instances of, uh, let's say, people or code list and so on. And they ask without specifying the, the IRI of the named graph. So they query the default graph. Now, if your endpoint is structured using name, name graphs and you have the default graph empty, those queries will also result in uh, an empty response. In case where this is uh, not the desired behavior, you can use something called a union graph. Um, a union graph is an approach for Spark querying, where actually when you do not specify any named graph, uh, the triple store does a union of all graphs present in the triple store and allows you to query that union. So all the triples from all the different named graphs um, become members of one union graph and you actually query this one. Now, um, in Apache Jena Fuseki, which is one of the triple store implementations, uh, the union graph is off by default, which means that when you have a Fuseki instance, with default configuration, and you query uh, without specifying the name graph, you actually query only the default graph and not the data in the name graphs. On the other hand, OpenLink Virtuoso, which is another 
implementation of RDF triple store, it has the union graph on by default. So there, if you do not specify any particular name graph, you actually query the data from all graphs present in the triple store. This might be a little bit confusing because um, the triple stores, the individual triple stores uh, behave uh, differently uh, when configured um, uh, in a default manner. But that is how it is. And the important thing is that, for instance, in Fuseki, you can actually switch uh, or change this setting so you can enable the union graph behavior, which uh, is, I would say, the more expected out of the two. Now, we already know that you can use named graph to store additional metadata about the triples contained in the named graph. So this is how it would look like. So here we have a graph uh, with this IRI, people data slash graph slash John. And in that named graph, we have these triples. The John is a person, uh, has a name Johnny and has a birthday. Here yeah, I have a mistake here, but uh, he has a birthday. And all these triples belong to the named graph. And then about the named graph, we have additional metadata. For instance, here, John, uh, <clears throat> which is the IRI of this named graph, um, has a source. And uh, this triple or statement says that this data was, uh, was scraped from LinkedIn, for instance. And we can have additional metadata like when and so on. So that is one. Uh, use case. Another use case for named graphs is called graph per resource. What you can do is say, okay, I have a data set about uh, people and all the triples uh, talking about one particular person will go into a named graph dedicated to that person. So I'll have one named graph for Johnny and I'll have another named graph for Lucy and so on. And those named graphs will contain all the triples relating to that particular resource. The advantage of this approach is that uh, when you imagine a setting when you want to delete all the triples regarding one particular person, you can do it easily. You just delete the whole named graph. Uh, when you want to replace the data, again, you can do it easily. If you would have all the triples for all people stored in one named graph, it would not be so easy because let's say you'll have a triple that John was born in Prague, and then you'll have a triple that Prague has a name, city of Prague. And then you would have Lucy who was also born in Prague. Now, if you want to delete all the data regarding to John, the question is whether you should or should not delete the data about Prague. Um, in case where John was the only one in your data set born in Prague, you would expect to also delete the representation of Prague. Uh, however, you have also Lucy born in Prague, so then um, you should not delete the data and so on. So using the graph per resource, you would have that you have a person named John, John was born in Prague and Prague has the label city of Prague in the graph related to John. And you would have the triplets, Lucy um, was born in Prague and Prague has the name city of Prague in the name graph uh, belonging to, uh, to Lucy. And then it would be clear that you always delete the whole name graph uh, and you do not have to worry about how many times a resource is used in your data and so on. So it has some advantages. The disadvantages uh, include that you'll have uh, lots of uh, named graphs, which might uh, cause some problems in some RDF uh, triple store implementations. So that's uh, the disadvantage. Now, another use case for named graphs uh, is called graph per source, where you would have one named graph per let's say a source uh, website and all the triples generated from that website, you would have stored in one named graph. So here we would have uh, uh, this file somewhere on the web and an application downloading that file and storing all the triples found in this file in a named graph with the file as an IRI. Uh, 
In this case, it would be easy to just delete all triples coming from a particular file. For instance, when we discover that uh, the file is not to be trusted or that the file was deleted and we also want to delete the data in our triple store. So this is another way of utilizing named graphs. We have one named graph per source of data. And we can also combine those. So we can have a graph per aspect pattern where we as managers of that triple store say, what is an aspect? And uh, we'll have all the triples regarding to this aspect in one named graph. And now the aspect can be anything we want. In this case, or this example, one aspect of the data is, uh, is uh, the core description of something. So something has a name. So that's the core data, one aspect. Another aspect is tags or keywords. So we'll say that this document has a keyword bath and, uh, and travel. Another aspect of the data might be links. So uh, we'll have uh, this document links to another, uh, another IRI or, or something like that. So those are different aspects of the data, uh, not related to the source of the data, not related to the resource, uh, but related to some kind of aspect of the data. And then another aspect might be um, all the main graphs used for a specific um, specific uh, resource, let's say. So that may be another aspect. Right, so the takeaway from uh, those, uh, those um, patterns is that named graphs is a technique which can be used in many different scenarios. And uh, when you come to a triple store with no further information, you should not expect uh, any particular um, separation of triples into named graphs because it is up to the author of the triple store to decide which of those um, patterns they will use to split triples into, uh, into named graphs. Right, so those were the data management uh, patterns, which brings us to the last group of patterns, application patterns. So now we'll be in the position of uh, creators of uh, software, of applications, working with the data, either reading the data or writing the data, creating the data. And uh, again, we'll have a set of situations uh, with the best practices in, uh, in those situations. The first one just uh, um, applies to the situation when you just want to um, ask if there is some data about some IRI uh, in a triple store. For that, you actually do not need to get the data. You just want to know whether there is some data and for that, we have the Sparkle Ask query, which can be executed in a more efficient manner than let's say a Sparkle Select or Sparkle Construct. So this, uh, this pattern just emphasizes that there is Sparkle Ask. Uh, also, you can use Sparkle Describe. So those uh, two less commonly used um, constructs in Sparkle, uh, you can use those to quickly scan Sparkle endpoints, for instance. Another pattern is called uh, blackboard. And this one, again, emphasizes the fact that you can both read and write a data set uh, in, in parallel. Um, it is a little bit depicted uh, on, on the picture. So in here, uh, in this uh, pattern, you would imagine a data set as a blackboard and uh, multiple people or multiple processes might actually write on the blackboard in, in one time, together creating the whole data set in parallel and each focusing on some aspect of the data. So for instance, uh, with the previous example, one person or one application could uh, write or read the tags of some documents, another application, the titles of the documents and so on. And uh, when all those processes or people are finished with reading or creating the data, the data set is complete. Uh, so this just emphasizes that um, big tasks on single data sets can be split, typically can be split into smaller tasks 
which can be executed in parallel. Now, the bounded description is also a pattern that we already come across. When I talked about the Sparkle describe a query, uh, I was talking about that this type of query is actually not uh, entirely specified in the Sparkle specification. Um, it is not clear what should be returned as a description of a particular resource. So, um, yep. Yeah. So the the variants uh, of uh, bounded description are those four basic ones. Either you get all the statements as a description of this uh, particular IRI, all the statements uh, that uh, uh, actually here you get all the data type properties. Data type properties are uh, are predicates which have literals as values. So one of the ways of describing this resource is returning all RDF statements with literal values um, in the object position. Uh, the other type of, pro of property or predicate linking a node to another node, a thing to another thing, uh, is called object property. So another idea of how a description of a particular resource should look like is to actually give all the links, all the RDF statements connecting this IRI to other IRIs. And uh, so that's another way of doing that. Uh, you can, of, of course, combine those two. And uh, when, you, when you do, you get the concise bound description here. Um, however, with the concise here, meaning that if you would end up in a blank node for which you later cannot query because it's a blank node, you go recursively uh, and until you get to something which is not a blank node. So it might be a large piece of data that you actually return uh, as a description of a particular resource. Um, and uh, symmetric concise bounded description is the same thing, only going also in the reverse direction. So um, giving all the RDF statements where this particular resource is in the object position. Um, so what is typically uh, implemented in RDF triple stores is this one, concise bounded description. But some of them, uh, such as Open Virtuoso, allow you to explicitly choose a strategy of, uh, of answering these queries. Uh, some of those uh, have one of those strategies just hard coded. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, the describe query is not uh, specified and it can actually be implemented as any of, of those. Right, uh, another pattern deals with how you should consume linked data and get more relevant data. So the fourth principle of linked data tells you to include links to other data in, in descriptions of your things in your data set. And this um, pattern for your nodes pattern actually exploits this. And basically it says, okay, you can start with what you get from one IRI and it will the data will contain links to other data sets. So, follow those links and get more data. And in that data, you will again uh, have links to other, uh, other entities, other things. So again, follow those uh, links. So this uh, way of actually consuming link data is called follow your nodes. And it is the same thing as if you were reading web pages and you would click through uh, the links in those web pages. So this just emphasizes that this is the way to uh, consume uh, or use linked data and get more data about stuff. Um, this pattern missing isn't broken. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, talks about the fact that we are dealing with data on the web and uh, data on the web may be missing some, uh, some properties because uh, various publishers may decide that various properties from some vocabularies are more important than others, may decide to include some data and exclude some other data sets and so uh, da data properties. And basically this pattern tells you 
to be careful when uh, querying uh, endpoints or uh, processing data you found, find on the web uh, because they might, they might miss some parts that you expect that uh, will be there. Um, so you basically should expect that uh, any pieces of data might be missing um, whenever you work with remote data sets. And it might be by design. Uh, so that's why it's not, not broken. Right, the named query pattern has the goal of uh, actually shielding users of your data from the complexities of the Sparkle language. So um, you might imagine that not every uh, user of data on the web knows Sparkle. However, even though uh, those people and applications might be able to actually use your data published as linked data in a Sparkle endpoint, um, but you can make it easier for them by uh, identifying typical Sparkle queries used with your data and hiding them behind simple APIs uh, like this one. So let's say that um, users of your data commonly ask these kinds of queries, uh, all IRI um, IR of people and uh, their home pages, and they want to list those and it is a very common query. So instead of forcing them to formulate the Sparkle queries all the time, uh, you might uh, create an API such as this one, uh, an endpoint such as this one, where you basically assign an IRI to this query. And uh, whenever someone accesses this simple IRI, they already uh, or directly get the answer to this Sparkle query. So basically it's just naming the query and hiding it behind uh, an IRI so that uh, the users do not have to formulate the Sparkle query. But otherwise, implementation-wise, accessing this IRI does nothing else than asking this query on top of your endpoint. Right, the next two patterns we already talked about um, in the, uh, or regarding the Blackboard pattern. So you can, uh, you can write and read your data in parallel, uh, but we didn't discuss uh, why it might be important technologically. And uh, for instance, uh, imagine that you have a, a large file that you want to load uh, into a database. This file might have a few gigabytes, let's say. Um, it is very impractical to create one HTTP POST request with a few gigabytes of data because um, you risk that uh, some timeouts will occur, that some, some firewall on the way uh, will be restrictive and will not wait for your data to be loaded and so on. So it might be a good idea when dealing with larger pieces of data to actually split the data in smaller pieces uh, and have uh, multiple requests instead of one big request. That might uh, help you with uh, working with large, larger data, both uh, when loading, and uh, with uh, uh, retrieval of the data, because that's the same problem. Um, right. Um, and uh, those timeouts and so on can occur in Sparkle endpoints because the database itself is configured, uh, for instance, in a way which allows you to ask for queries that take less than a few seconds to evaluate. But the, uh, the, the timeouts may also happen on the HTTP level because on the way there is some a misconfigured firewall or a very restrictively configured firewall. Right. Um, we talked about, uh, we talk about data on the web and publishing data on the web and publishing data using the HTTP protocol. Now, I think you already, uh, all of you know that uh, on the web, caches are important pieces of the web architecture. So to, to avoid overloading servers, serving web pages, which are not changed so much, um, there are actually caches. Uh, so when you access an IRI, you actually might end up hitting a cache, not the target server, and the cache uh, will give you 
the lastly known uh, state of a web page. Um, and uh, this cached version of the web page will get deleted once in a while um, to ensure freshness of, of the web pages. The same technique, the caching, can be used for data because data in RDF is nothing more than text documents served using HTTP. So again, if your data doesn't change so often, you might consider using a typical web cache and it might help you with, uh, for instance, Sparkle queries because some Sparkle queries might be again, computationally expensive, but if your data doesn't change so much and some of the queries are very common, uh, it might be beneficial to actually cache the response and then serve only the cached response because both the Sparkle query request is a typical HTTP request and the response is a document that can be cached. So uh, this uh, pattern just points that out that um, RDF data can be successfully cached using uh, regular web caches used for web pages. Right, so we are nearing the end, but before we actually end, there are a few more patterns. One is called schema annotation, which basically says that if you fill your data with a web form, some of the properties might be, for instance, uh, required or ignored. And it might be worth uh, your while to actually um, have the data about this fact already in your data uh, rather than in the design of your user interface. Um, so here we have a, a required property and a ignored property, which are both RDF properties. And then uh, we can uh, say that, uh, let's say a false name or a false DNA checksum is a required property or ignored property in the context of um, some user interface which allows us to know from the data which properties are required and which are not. The alternative to that, the worst alternative is actually having regular properties and then having a user interface in form, uh, which has this logic baked into the form. Um, then by uh, just by looking at the data, you will not be able to know uh, this because a piece of that logic will be baked into the UI instead of the data. Right, uh, smooshing is a technique of dealing with our sameness links and equivalence links in general. So um, already we talked about this and smooshing is the label for it. Uh, let's take a look at the example. We'll have a product uh, which we know is the same as another camera here. So this product number six is the same as camera number 10. And uh, camera number 10 has a manufacturer and a company manufactured that camera. Now, if we apply smooshing, which means uh, taking advantage of this our same as link, uh, we can have data like this. So product six stays, uh, the label is the same and the same as link stays, but then we'll have, uh, we'll have the manufacturer here with the product number six instead of camera number 10, because we know that product number six and camera number 10 are the same things. So we basically replace all the subjects with the same as IRI, uh, resulting in the data which is smooshed. Uh, so this is a technique of dealing with the our same as links in your applications. Right, uh, the transformation query is again, just an emphasis that Sparkle allows you to do construct queries to transform data from one uh, representation to another. You all, or most of you use Sparkle in your semester projects to transform data into RDF. So you already know this one. This is just a, a name for, uh, for the technique and transformation query, a Sparkle construct query, which allows you to take data uh, in one uh, representation and construct a completely different representation of the data in RDF. And the last pattern here is IRI resolver. Um, 
when you think about how you would work with RDF data in your application, given that that RDF data or link data can be published in many different ways as a Sparkle endpoint, as a IRID reference, as an RDF dump or embedded in a web page. Um, when you want to create a generic application working with such data, um, you would end up with implementing all those different ways of accessing data in each of the applications that you use. Um, the IRI resolver pattern actually uh, is um, or hints at the possibility that this logic can be uh, implemented only once as a software component called an IRI resolver, which you then can call with an IRI of anything um, as a parameter and leave it up to the resolver to choose the proper technique of actually getting the data about that IRI and returning the data to your application. Um, so uh, on, on the side of uh, the interface to your application, the IRI resolver just gets the parameter, the IRI of the thing your application wants data about and the application gets the data. So this is just um, an interface and the IRI resolver based on the configured strategy then decides which way is the best to get the data about that IRI, which Sparkle endpoints to query, which web pages to search for, uh, which IRIs to be referenced and so on. So basically this is a split of the decision of how to get the data about a certain IRI away from, uh, from your uh, user facing applications. Right, so those, uh, this was a catalog of um, various linked data patterns. Um, some of those you might uh, want to apply in your semester project. Next time we'll talk about linking and metadata. Any questions? If not, then uh, see you in a week. <laughs>